Hello everyone, it's Josh Green with Artist Aaron Academy, and today I want to talk about point of view or POV. Point of view is the heart of creative painting and creative arts in general. And I thought it'd be nice to frame this within a story about the uprising of modern art. A painting is created from the relative facts of the painter out into the world. The painter attempts to translate their experiences into a material body that could possibly long outlive them. Whether the painting depicts a literal view of a landscape or a view of an abstract expression, these views are relative to the subject, in this case, the artist. What we consider today a creative artist attempts to express their personal experience to an audience. This is the core of modern art. We're not joining in to a dominant point of view. We're not creating art for someone else, like a commission. We value people who have unique points of views and contribute something new, never before it's seen, to the art world. Okay, so what is the history of this? So, Let's go back in time a little bit and talk about what happened before modern art. Uh, young boys and girls would join a master craftsman in the studio and would learn the trade, would learn the craft of painting, the craft of sculpting. In a lot of these studios, they did many, many different jobs. And you'd work there making art for churches, for kings, whoever, for sometimes the middle class, making icons for the middle class until you became a master and until you started your own studio. That's what an artist was for most of time. After the Renaissance, we had an idea of beauty and art. These ideas held true for many centuries, which led to what's known as an academic tradition. This was a tradition beyond the studio, a tradition where you go join a school called an academy and you'd study under many different artists learning many different subjects. Sometimes they studied geometry, other popular philosophies at the time, and they'd be considered a master artist after they graduated. So it's very different than going and working under a master craftsman, than going to an academy and learning from many masters, a lot of the philosophies of art. But still the intention was to get commission work or patronage from some ruling family or church. Okay, and this is what art looked like from the academy. This was the epitome of academic art called history painting. Uh, the greatest academic painters depicted big moments in history. War scenes were popular or moments from mythology, Christian or pagan mythology. These were the most significant art societies in Western Europe in the 19th century. There were the Royal Academy of Arts in France and England, established around 1650 and 1750, respectively. They ran schools of instruction, held annual and semi-annual exhibitions, which some of them are still the largest art fairs in history, even today, and provided venues where artists could display their work and cultivate critical notice. Um, here, young artists could find themselves promoted to prominence through patronage connections and collectively seek protection of their artistic interests. Uh, from the late 18th century, as dominated by Jacques-Louis David, who painted this painting here, the head of the French Academy, and Sir Joshua Reynolds was the head of the Academy in England. Such institutions had a virtual monopoly on public taste and official patronage. You had to pass through the academies if you were going to be a professional artist. There was no other way. If you wanted to be a professional artist, you had to paint like this. There were no other ways to paint. That obviously leads to a period of stagnation when you're just repeating a culture and not allowing any creatives in, allowing any innovation, uh, the painting will stagnate. And it did for several hundred years. There were movements within it, romanticism and the such, but generally there wasn't any big radical changes 
The Tipping Point for Academic Art. You know, this is by Bouguereau, the head of the French Academy right before the fall. Um, everyone was asking, does this art reflect life at all? You know, here's a scene of Bacchus. What does this have to do with us? What does this have to do with our problems today? This was just sort of for an elite, you know, art for the elite. It didn't have anything to do with daily life. This all changed primarily with one artist, Gustave Courbet. He developed a movement called realism. And this isn't painting things realistically. This is a realism that deals with everyday life. Courbet was born in 1819 and died in 1877. He was a French painter who led the realist movement in the 19th century and committed to painting only what he could see. Okay, he was painting directly from life. He rejected the academic convention and the romanticist movement of the previous generations of visual artists. His independence set an example that was important to later artists. So his stance on providing a unique point of view in art created modern art, created art as we think of it today, and really changed most of culture in all fields. Um, he paved the way for for pretty much every modern art movement after him. So here's what his art looked like. Now, this is a radical, radical change from, let's go back to Bougaros here. These are ideal figures from a myth, a Greek myth, and everything's highly realistic. Um, the anatomy is perfect. The light is perfect. This is the highest quality of technique and craftsmanship that an artist can have. Okay, and here, this is real people wearing rugged, ripped clothes, covered in dirt, smashing rocks. And this was radical because he put peasants on the wall of the salon. This had never been done before. These were everyday people, glorified, dignified. So I found this nice little quote. History is made by an elite few, while the rest of us reap the fields. And so the field reapers decided it was their time to be on the walls of the salon. Um, he led for a whole new generation of artists to be brave, to speak out their points of views on society, even if it wasn't popular. So the next landmark artist after Courbet was Manet. To our eyes, you know, once again, this painting isn't that radical at all. This is a stepping stone towards Impressionism. See the light brushwork? People would get upset, like, why didn't you finish the painting? Why isn't it rendered? And then notice also the atmospheric perspective, the scale of the trees, the scale of the figure in the background are inaccurate. And Manet did this on purpose. This was a statement. This was about painting, the significance of painting, that uh, you don't have to be a slave to technique. Paint in general is just beautiful. And here, the most stunning part of the painting is that there's a nude woman staring directly at us. And during this time, a lot of the rich men would hire prostitutes, take them to the park. And that's exactly what this is. And she is empowered. She's staring back at the viewer. And in most paintings of women at the time, the head is turned away and their bodies are highly idealized. And it's meant for men to gaze upon. They were sexual objects. And today this is known as the male gaze. It's a whole subject in art history. But he, he painted a woman looking directly back at the viewer. And at the time this would have been shocking that a woman could be empowered. And also by her staring back, she has her own personality, thoughts, and character. She is not just a mindless subject for you to gaze upon. Here's his other landmark painting, Olympia. And this is a prostitute receiving the collar. He brought flowers. She is once again staring directly at us. And today, you know, we probably wouldn't think much of this painting, but at the time, it was a radical, radical statement. You know, this shows that there was ideas of, of feminism beginning to blossom in France at that time. And he was popularizing that just like 
in the realist movement, um, empowering the worker. So also this time was the Industrial Revolution. Things were changing and artists could buy tubed manufactured paint. And this allowed artists to paint outdoors. One of the academic studies that every painter would learn is the color value study, where you would paint an impression of the light of the thing you're studying, okay? And this was done very loosely to get an idea of what colors you would need to buy to make the painting, how to create the space, um, composition ideas. This was not intended to be an artwork. And on this famous day, Monet and Renoir were out doing these color value studies at this location. Monet decided maybe this is the artwork. You know, maybe this is it. I also noticed that this isn't a myth. This is painting directly from life. Like Corbet had said, we're painting everyday subjects and just like Manet was doing, we have loosened up technique to focus on the paint quality. Science was booming under, under the new forms of capitalism. Michael um, Cheval was a wallpaper manufacturer and he got a lot of complaints when complementary colors were placed next to each other. And he invented the theory of the color wheel. At this time, you know, many scientists were giving talks at the academies like, for example, cloud formations was a new field during the late uh, 19th century, and that showed up in paintings. Um, color theory really influenced the Impressionists, and people were focusing on science because science was becoming the truth rather than um, myths from the past. Um, atheism was on the rise because of Darwinism, empiricism. Radical, radical changes were happening as culture was opening up to new points of views. And once Impressionism was fully formed, paintings like this were being made unskilled. You know, there's no drawing. This is just free flowing paint. And you can see the use of complementary colors, the blue and orange used in different amounts or used to neutralize each other to create a sense of light. This was an absolutely radical painting and the salons completely rejected it. And so these new artists contributing new points of views created their own salon called the Salon of the Refused. It slowly started beginning traction. There's also new academies forming that were more open to modern movements like the Academy Julian. And here we go, Monet in his prime, making paintings about light. He would do several paintings in the same space focused on just how the light was falling. This was radical at the time, a complete abandon of the academic mindset. Pointillism came about. This was kind of a mix of science and art, the science of optics. Cezanne was questioning the finish of paintings. He said, these are finished drawings, these are done, leaving these giant spaces in the drawing. Uh, many, many radical points of views were happening. Matisse, liberating color from form. These are just color blocks leading into abstraction. This was all in the same, you know, century. Radical, radical change. And here we come full circle. Here's a modern depiction of a woman and a drawing of a still life. So the academy had fallen and now the modern artist had taken the center stage and we shifted into this new uh, perspective where we valued individuals and we have valued new points of views that progressed culture. Another thing going on at that time, this is in the 1550s, was colonization, uh, beginning of colonizing the Americas and Africa. And so here's a map of the European colonies during that time. Here's by 1880, most of the world had been colonized. And here's by 1936, the colonies. So what this led to was new art objects coming into Western European culture. And these were radical points of views. Um, this was a forgotten way of thinking about art. Art objects as, as bodies for spirits, art objects as ceremonial pieces. This was art with a function. Um, but the Europeans were seeing it under the art conception of art today, uh, the radical geometric forms 
reducing faces to this and the radical use of color and shape um, African art and art from the Americas in Oceania um, played a pivotal role in the development of modern art especially Picasso collected African art the geometric forms the intensity the aggressiveness of these figures really spoke to him and it led to this painting by Picasso which began the Cubist tradition here's a close up we can see the faces mimicking those African masks uh, Gauguin moved to Oceania and painted brown figures free and happy under their own religion and this is being shown this is very radical for the time and also Japan had opened its borders um, a highly developed society with a very intricate art tradition captured the imagination of, of almost every westerner print by hokusai so james manila whistler another major figure in modern art this is a painting by him featuring all the new fabrics coming in the prints the the furniture he ended up creating a movement uh, with art liberated from concept those art for art's sake it was that art in the arrangement of shapes and colors in the plane are enough it doesn't need a mythology or or moral just the beauty of paint on a canvas is enough and here's some examples of excitement over asian art we have a uh, whistler van gogh and the trek here so art for art's sake um it influenced architecture led to um, art nouveau and art deco and here we can see this painting by Whistler was starting to head towards abstract painting. Um, opening up the borders led to uh, new types of graphic design like this, the radical reduction of figures. Because of uh, the opening up of art and also in other fields to new perspectives, uh, Western culture boomed and changed at a radical pace. During this time of capitalism and science, Einstein's theory of relativity came out uh, changing our understanding of the world. Quantum mechanics changed everything. Psychology was a new field. The industrial revolution, coal and steam engines, flight. Does time exist as we know it? This was a time when we began questioning our fundamental preconceptions of nature. Does time exist? I'm made of quanta. What does that mean? Uh, there's more dimensions, more spatial dimensions than three in physics. It was also World War I. We were witnessing a world where people were exterminating each other on um, an industrial level. This led to Dadaism, a complete rejection of all belief systems and governments, and uh, created a nihilism and absurdism. Uh, sometimes we think our art isn't contributing much or that art is useless, but actually ideas are the most powerful thing in human culture. Ideas start with new perspectives, opening it up, questioning. And if we stagnate, then society does not progress. Uh, for you taking a stance, for you speaking your own truths, for you making a statement on society and gearing that towards an audience, that is what it means to be an artist today. And it's a very generous thing to do. It's a very hard road to be an individual. You can rest easy knowing that you contributed new ideas, new ways of seeing to your field, to the world, to the people around you. And it doesn't have to be the hit where it influences the whole world. You can influence your community. In any case, if you never show it, you at least got deep into yourself and who you are.